Well, I won't provide a full bi biography because I understand that Ali is going to speak a little about uh, from his own um, perspective, but just to give you a sense of his background. Uh, he writes that as far as he can remember, one of his grandfathers, who was a tailor, would recite poetry of the Persian poet Rumi. Uh, his maternal grandfather recited for him the, poet, the poetry of Saadi, and by the time he was ready for higher, edu higher education, the government of Iran had changed and music schools were no more. In 1982, with the aid of a, a $1 pocket radio, Voice of America, and the BBC, he taught himself English recording the broadcast and listening to the quotations many times to memorize them. Having connected with Thoreau's writings, he undertook the labor of translating Walden into his native Persian, a task others more educated had begun and given up. Via the internet, including a Walden list on Yahoo, remember what Yahoo was? He sought with the help uh, with English nuances and puns from the most prominent Thoreau scholars. With Walden completed and ready for publication in July 2015, the Thoreau Society and Thoreau Institute brought Tagdara to the United States, his first trip outside of Iran, where he visited Concord and Walden Pond, the places that Thoreau and Emerson read and admired the Persian poets who had always been part of his life. Today, he will be speaking on his work, reading Thoreau's Walden in Iran and its translation into Persian. Please join me in welcoming to BYU Ali Reza Tagdari. I'm very glad and honored to be among you. Fifteen years ago, I picked up Walden for the first time, and over the past ten years, I've been trying to translate it. I knew it was a very difficult book, of, but I had no idea that it would take me such a long time to read and finish the trans my first translation, because I'm going to work on it much longer. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Professor George Handley of the Humanities Department and Corey Leonard of the Kennedy Center and also Brigham Young University for making my presence here possible. So far, I have been to five different states in the US, crisscrossing the country three times. I say it with all my heart that I never found anywhere closer to my heart than Utah. Its, uh, its spiritual atmosphere simply touched my heart very deeply. It makes Utah and its people unique, both in the US and in my heart. I would like to ask for your permission to begin with a line of poetry from Rumi, first in our mother tongue and then in its translation. He says, Ab kamju, teshnegi avar bedast past. It means, seek thirst, not water. And then water will flow from every high and low corner of the universe on you. In order to clarify the meaning of this intriguing poem, I always ask myself two questions. Who drinks more water? The one who has more water or the one who is more thirsty? And who discovers water first? The one who is thirsty or the one who simply wants water? It was the thirst that I learned and earned from Rumi and other great mystics in my literature that brought me to the water in Walden Pond. Iran has a highly rich literature, but part of its richness lies in the fact that our mystics and poets teach us to be thirsty for the universal truth that also lies in other cultures and languages. That is the reason I spent 10 years of my life on the careful study and translation of Thoreau's Walden. I saw many seas and oceans on my way to Thoreau's home. But even within American literature, the ocean in Melville's masterpiece Moby Dick or the sea in Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea could not match Thoreau's humble pond and quench the thirst in my soul. The reason is that Thoreau does not seek a fish or a whale or even water. He seeks thirst, 
in Walden, Thoreau's thirst has created a new world for him and for the rest of the whole humanity. He says, I have, as it were, my own sun and moon and the stars and a little world all to myself, a little world all to myself. But we must be careful about the meaning of the world little here. What seems little in the eyes of a great soul like Thoreau can ironically be as boundless and as wide as a galaxy. How can the world of a man be little who finds the earth like a point in space? He says, this whole earth which we inhabit is but a point in space. How far apart, think you, dwell the two most distant inhabitants of yonder star, the breath of whose disk cannot be appreciated by our instruments? Why should I feel lonely? Is not our planet in the Milky Way? Any kind of separation between us and the rest of humanity is an indication of the fact that we live in a small world. If we live in the world that Thoreau describes to us, geographical distances, languages, cultures, religions, and no other aspect of our personal life or social life will separate us from the rest of humanity. The inhabitants of yonder star in Thoreau's sentence show us that we are not just bound to live on planets or even just on the earth. Stars are also habitable, but only if we choose to live on light. I think that like Thoreau, Rumi also believes that the creation of this artistic, mystical world is the key to the expansion of our world and the salvation of our souls. In a similar line of poetry, Rumi says, do not ask me about this world or that world, for both worlds are lost in the world where I live. Thoreau moves to Walden Pond with the same thirst that Rumi describes in his poem. Walden is the story of Thoreau's thirst for a deliberate life. One sample of his thirst is his intense desire for the coming of the spring. He is thirsty for the spring. And he says, one attraction in coming to the woods to live was that I should have the leisure and opportunity to see the spring come in. But when did the spring come in? When did Thoreau's thirst discover that the spring has arrived? Let us take this example when he says, the first sparrow of a spring, the year beginning with younger hope than ever, the faint silvery warblings heard over the partially bare and moist field from the bluebird, the song sparrow, and the red wing, as if the last flakes of winter tinkled as they fell. The brooks sing carols and glees to the spring. The marsh hawk sailing low over the meadow is already seeking the first slimy life that awakes. The sinking sound of melting snow is heard in all dells, and the ice dissolves apace in the ponds. The grass flames up on the hillsides like, as, like a spring fire." End quote. Is that it? Was it at this time that Henry discovered the long-awaited spring? Did Thoreau really need so many signs to notice the arrival of the long-desired season? No, it is not. Like Rumi, Thoreau teaches us that a true thirsty man drinks the first sign of whatever his dreams bring to him. If we recognize the thirst that exists in Thoreau and his Walden, we would notice that he describes the coming of the spring in a single sentence in Walden when he says, the cracking and booming of the ice indicate a change in temperature. A thirsty man watches the ice and sees rivers, listens to the cracking and booming of the ice and hears the songs of a thousand spring sparrows. Spring will then embrace such a thirst intimately with its sparrow. Thoreau says, 
I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment while I was hoeing in a village garden, and I felt that I was more distinguished by the circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet I could have worn." End quote. If we are not thirsty, we will never notice any spring or any other blessing that the creation bestows on us. Thoreau recites the story of Rumi's thirst very beautifully when he says, the soul not being a mistress of herself, it's a quote actually in Walden, one looks and one does not see, one listens and one does not hear, one eats and one does not know the savor of food. Imagine how many springs have passed us in life while we even did not notice. Considering the long time it took Thoreau to write Walden, it is not strange that it took me as many years to study this great book and translate it into Persian. Thoreau himself says, books must be read as deliberately as they were written. Let me give you just one example of what Thoreau was doing during the long process of writing Walden. In chapter Solitude, he says, in one heavy winter shower, the lightning struck a large pitch pine across the pond, making a very conspicuous and perfectly regular spiral groove from top to bottom, an inch or more deep and four or five inches wide, as you would groove a walking stick. This is one moment. Lightning strikes the tree. I passed it again the other day and was struck with awe on looking up and beholding that mark now more, than, more distinct than ever, where a terrific and resistless boat came down out of the harmless sky eight years ago. Here I realized that Thoreau was not just editing his book during the long process of writing it. He was actually editing the way he looked at the world. It is amazing that this single sentence covers a time span of eight years. Eight years have passed between the time lightning struck the tree in the, sent in the sentence, and the sentence, I passed it again the other day. Thoreau does not look at the world around him with the eyes of habit and conformity. Rumi says, every breath the world renews itself, while we are unaware of renewing ourselves in life. In Walden, Thoreau renews his eyes to watch an ever-changing world with extreme thirst and soulful desire. He says, I have traveled a good deal in Concord, but his journey in a village of only 2,000 inhabitants is more spiritual and poetical than geographical. As Perost say, said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new land, but in seeing with new eyes. Walden is the story of a true voyage of discovery. There are times that he is not alone and enjoy the company of a beautiful society in his journey. He says, I had more cheering visitors than the last. Children come a burying, railroad men taking a Sunday morning walk in clean shirts, fishermen and hunters, poets and philosophers, in short, all honest pilgrims who came out, of the out to the woods for freedom's sake and really left the village behind, I was ready to greet." End quote. As we can see, Thoreau has absolutely no problem getting along and enjoying the company of all other people. But, with, but when you are creating your own world, there comes a day when you have to go it alone. In the first sentence I heard from Thoreau in life, he says, the man who goes today, the man who goes alone can start today, but he who travels with another must wait until that other is ready. And it may be a long time before they get off, end quote. Philosophers, hunters, children who pick berries, railroad men, who take a Sunday morning walk, and no one else knows what world you have in mind as you leave horizons behind. In such pioneering moments, 
when sorrow is beyond all boundaries that customs, traditions, habits, and presuppositions put before us, only a poet can meet him. It is no longer time for picking berries, hunting, taking a Sunday morning walk, or even philosophizing. It is time for pure poetry. He says, the one who came from farthest to my lodge through deepest snows and most dismal tempests was a poet, a farmer, a hunter, a soldier, a reporter, even a philosopher may be daunted. But nothing can deter a poet for he is actuated by pure love. Who can predict his comings and goings? His business calls him out at all hours, even when doctors sleep, end quote. Going far beyond horizons and leaving so many other walks of life behind makes Thoreau the renowned quintessential American poet. Thoreau was not a hermit, unlike what many of his critics mention about him. He did not move to the woods in order to leave society behind and live like a hermit. Right in the beginning of Walden, in his first move, in order to start building his cabin, he borrows an axe from a man, and his reason is, I borrowed an axe and went down to the woods by Walden Pond and began to cut down tall, arrowy white pines. It is difficult to begin without borrowing, but perhaps it is most generous thus to permit your fellow men to have an interest in your enterprise. The owner of the axe, as he released his hold on it, said that it was the apple of his eye, but I returned it sharper than I received it. He begins cooperation with another human being, right in the beginning of Walden. From the very beginning, Walden is a sacred lesson of cooperation that stems from love and friendship. By borrowing the axe, Thoreau even taught me how to read his book. I had already studied Walden several times over the course of four years, and I needed help to understand most of it. It was then that I asked some of the most distinguished American scholars to help me through the internet and lend me their access. If Walden had not yet been translated by then, it was not because nobody knew it. It was because everybody knew it was an extremely difficult book. For 10 years, these great scholars sharpened my eyes enough to read one of the most, world's most beautiful, most precious books. Among them are such great scholars as Dr. Robert Richardson, Dr. Richard Schneider, who just sent me a letter this morning. He was worried why I didn't send him any questions for three weeks while I was here in the US. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Donald Ross, distinguished scholars like Jeff Kramer, our mutual friend, Wallace Kaufman, Thomas Hood, Austin Meredith, and the late Professor Stephen C. Shear, whose memories and lessons are between the lines of my translation. As I am standing here, Wallace Kaufman is talking from Oregon to my beloved children in order in Iran, in order for them to feel less lonely while I'm away from them. These are the lessons we all learned from the hermit of Concord. He has brought the whole world together. Thoreau himself lent me his perception and helped me to see some of the greatest moments of my own literature and culture in a more clear light. He says, if we respected only what is inevitable and has a right to be, music and poetry would resound along the streets. We will hear music everywhere in our streets. Thoreau does not mean that we should literally install loudspeakers in our streets to play songs and read poetry to us while we are busy with our hectic life. An actual example from Rumi's real life sheds light, light on the true meaning of Thoreau's profound sentence here. One day, Rumi was passing through Goldsmith's bazaar or marketplace. 
The noise of a goldsmith's hammer suddenly sounded so beautiful to him that he immediately began to dance to that sound in the marketplace. The goldsmith himself was so excited at the scene that he continued to hammer for such a long time that all his golden pieces were destroyed. What Thoreau really means by his sentence, that music will, would fill our streets, and Rumi by his dance and the goldsmith by his hammering, is that once we wash our eyes, once we wash the greed off our eyes and respect what is truly inevitable, every noise from all corners of this universe will turn into a beautiful music, even if it is the sound of a hammer. Here is another example of how Thoreau helped me understand the profound words of another Persian mystic. As a child, I read that a Persian sage was sitting alone when a man approached him and asked, why are you lonely? The sage looked up and said, I became lonely when you came. <laughs> For many years, I could not, I read it as a child in our elementary book textbooks. I could not realize how a man could become lonely by the arrival of another person. It was only by reading a sentence from Thoreau's Walden that I saw the depth of this profound sentence. It is where Thoreau says, solitude is not measured by miles of a space that intervene between a man and his fellows. Obviously, the sage was sitting beside his friend from across deserts while the man who sat beside him separated them from each other. I have never seen any poet in the world to be as close as American transcendentalist poets, particularly Emily Dickinson and Thoreau, to the Persian mystics and poets. The fact that Rumi is one of the most popular poets in the United States is an indication of the truth of my belief. In his book, Representative Men, Emerson says, Great geniuses have the shortest biographies. Their cousins can tell you nothing about them. They lived in their writings, and so their house and street life was trivial and commonplace. As a good chimney bears in smoke, so a philosopher converts the value of all his fortunes into his intellectual performance. But such is not the case with the writer that I love from the American literature. Thoreau says, how vain it is to sit down to write while we have not stood up to live. And I believe how vain it is to sit down to read and read the words of writers who did not believe in what they wrote. I wonder what would the old man from Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea say when he returns victoriously from the sea having killed an innocent fish for his personal pride only to see that the writer who wrote his story did not have the ability to stand up to live. As long as Thoreau's books are read across the world, he is alive. He will never die. He lives in his books and reveals his real life in his words. I found Rumi's purified heart in Thoreau's words. Rumi says in a book of a, in the book of a Sufi, there is no word and letters of education. The book of a Sufi consists of nothing but a heart as purified and white as a snow. And Thoreau leaves all the letters of education behind and says, I cannot count one. I know not the first letter of the alphabet. I have always been regretting that I was not as wise as the day as I was born. Next to his humble pond, away from all oceans and seas of the world, he says, I would drink deeper, fish in the sky whose bottom is pebbly with the stars. Whenever I walk among ordinary 
street people that are always beside me, reminding me that we can drink from the same river whose bottom is pebbly with the stars together every night. I found him when he revealed that, like me, he lived in a small cabin. I read Walden first when I and my wife and our first daughter lived in a small room. There was little room for a comfortable life or for enough furniture for us, but there was enough space to hold a copy of Walden and books of Rumi, Hafez, and Sadi's poetry with us. Thoreau says, could a greater miracle take place for us than to look through each other's eyes for an instant? And that instant when you can look through a man like Thoreau is when your small room becomes great. But again, when he says an instant, we must be extremely careful not to use our ordinary clocks to measure an instant when it is mentioned in the words of a great soul like Thoreau. I simply picked up Walden 15 years ago, and I have been looking through his eyes for an instant for 15 years. He dedicated his whole life, including two million words of writing, to people like me, only to add a single, deliberate, meaningful moment to our lives and show us that we can be rich in soul, in heart, and in our minds, even if we live in a very small room. One of the sentences that is very interesting to me in Walden is this. I am convinced that if all men were to live as simply as I then did, thieving and robbery, because he had nothing in his cabin, yeah, would be unknown. Thieving and robbery would be unknown. And I am convinced from my experience of reading Walden with so many American scholars over the course of a decade, that hostility, anger, and misunderstanding would be unknown between our nations. If we picked up books and read, read them with each other the way I did, I and my American friends did for 10 years. Let us allow Thoreau to sharpen our eyes on the value of friendship, on the value of love and friendship. I have written a poem in English, which I would like to read you today and end my talk. With all the unhappiness going on in the world, I gave this poem to the first American I saw in life six months ago. With all the unhappiness going on in the world, our friendship goes on. The world should behold. Nobody may rule the hearts that desire friendship and love that never expire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I think we have some time for questions, if that would be OK. Uh, OK. So yeah. we'll invite uh, those of you who'd like to ask questions to please form a line here. Tell us your name and, and, and if you're a student, what you're studying. And then uh, we'll go ahead with the time that we have left. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott McClelland. I'm a Middle East Studies and Arabic major here at BYU. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. Um, I have a brief question more about the translation process it's, itself. Um, from my understanding, there's kind of two approaches to translating. You can take a literal word-for-word -word translation when it comes to like idiomatic expressions and puns mm -hmm. and things like that, or to translate it into an expression like from Persian that has a similar meaning. What approach do you take in okay. translating Walden? From the sentence I wrote, uh, I, uh, I read from Thoreau where he says, I do not know the first letter of the alphabet. I take it to mean that Thoreau really wants us to transfer his message. He, there is a deep message 
uh, in Walden that has the priority. But of course, uh, Thoreau has uh, a very powerful poetical, uses a very powerful poetical language in Walden, which I do my best to preserve in my translation. Through careful study of Rumi's work, Sadi's work, Hafez poetry, uh, you know, they have enriched my language with their, with the eloquence and elegance of their poetry. So I think me or any other Iranian translator who approaches uh, Walden with the intention of translating this great book uh, already enjoys uh, the rich, a rich language and can use great resources from uh, the Persian language in order to transfer Thoreau's words into Persian. I have done my best to, pres to preserve Thoreau's poetical, mystical language in my translation. Sometimes there are uh, sentences that uh, you would try to be very literal, because some parts of Walden express very detailed, uh, precise scientific facts. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, he, Thoreau himself has expressed intense love and devotion to Persian poets. So in a way, he is referring me to my own poets in order right. to be able to understand his works and reflect his eloquent style. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Devin Sudweeks. I'm an sociocultural anthropology major. And I wanted to ask you if there was something that um, you felt was missing in American transcendentalist poetry that is in Persian poetry and vice versa, that something that you really appreciate. Uh, something that was missing in American transcendentalism, uh, something that we have and I didn't find in American transcendentalism, I, I found them to be very close together. Uh, uh, actually, I feel I'm reading the words. Actually, I feel I'm swimming in the ocean that receives its water, uh, in the same ocean that receives its water from your poets and my poets in my land. No, I never had that feeling. I find them to be very close in soul. Thoreau is as I mentioned here, Emily Dickinson and Thoreau are very, very close. I have so far, I have not found any poets in any other country to be this close to the poets that I love in my country. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us. I'm, I'm Chip Oscarson in Interdisciplinary Humanities. I teach here. And um, Thoreau is, um, and the other transcendentalists have been uh, really influential in shaping how American culture has imagined its relationship to the environment, to, to nature. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, kind of building on this last question, if, um, if that was difficult, if, if there presented any difficulties in, in that um, Iranian culture doesn't um, understand itself as having the same kind of relationship. You know, what, what are the differences between how Iranians see their relationship with nature and, and maybe mm -hmm. how um, American culture is understood through Thoreau um, mm -hmm. saw that same relationship? This, this is one of the aspects that is very much similar to the, to the Persian mystic's approach to nature. Uh, you cannot find in Persian classical literature and mysticism, you cannot find a single poet or mystic who ignores nature. Actually, uh, our poets and mystics look, see God in every corner in nature. Every element in nature they see, they see a sign of God. Uh, our poet Baba Tahir says, when I look at mountains, I see you. When I look at seas, I see you. Wherever I look at forests, flowers, anywhere else, I see your beautiful face. This is one of the things that uh, really struck me uh, when I started reading Walden. 
and Iranians feel very, uh, uh, very close to this approach to nature in Thoreau's works. I think it's very similar. Although uh, our environment is being hurt badly in today's world, and I think if our people refer to their own mystics and poets and Thoreau's writings, they will pay more attention to how sacred nature is and to its preservation. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Cox. I'm a mathematics Hello. major. Um, thank you so much for your remarks. I really loved the quote you started with from Rumi talking about seek water, not thirst. I was wondering, what do you feel has contributed to your thirst in discovering this poem and in understanding it? Uh, uh, I first began to love Thoreau when I read a sentence from him in a dictionary. <laughs> and heard another sentence from him, him on my pocket radio. So the fact that I dedicated such a long time of my life to Thoreau and, I'm a and I am studying him even now, is that I was really thirsty for what he had to give me. I brought my own thirst. Uh, that's why only two sentences or three sentences, which I read in dictionaries and heard from uh, pocket radio, uh, put, you know, tied my heart so tightly to his words and his works. And uh, as I said, I do not see uh, the water that my soul demands in any other works, even in American literature. You know, Melville is there with, with his ocean. But there is not enough water in his ocean for me, the water that I see in the, the small one that Walden Pond. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marissa Getz, and I'm also a Middle East Studies and Arabic major, um, although I have more of a focus in Persian now because I love it. Um, and I've just recently started to get acquainted with kind of the like, Iranian culture and how it's shown in literature and in Iranian films. Um, and I've just in like my the past few weeks, I've noticed that um, they're very different in a lot of ways. And I feel like um, a lot of, for example, um, the one that I'm thinking of is, have you seen the film Children of Heaven? Yes, I have seen it. Okay, but and so. Th the name that the film has in Iran is uh, Children of Heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, not that particular film. Maybe it has another name oh, in okay. Persian because it happens sometimes, uh -huh. okay? But I guess like in general what I've noticed is I feel like um, a lot of like Iranian literature, it has like, it portrays, it has like maybe more of an optimistic outlook on humanity, whereas a lot of our American stuff tends to be like very like, but cynical. Are you speaking about the contemporary uh, Persian contemporary, literature? Contemporary, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so how do you think that, um, sorry, this is a poorly formulated question. Um, how do you think that um, Americans um, could use Persian literature, kind of like the way that you're using Thoreau? Or like how can we draw um, like, how can we make stronger connections between our countries using our shared mm -hmm. literature or like where mm -hmm. in our literature um, but, intersects? You know, what I see in the contemporary uh, Persian literature is that they try to follow and imitate the Western culture mm -hmm. uh, most of the times. Um, I myself, it's, not just my, it's just my personal view, think that the classical Persian literature uh -huh. transcends time and geographical locations and languages and cultures. And I find it mu much, much, uh, you know, more profound and to the point. You will find more of the things you need in our classical literature mm -hmm. than the contemporary literature, although it has its own values and I, I have my own uh -huh. favorite poets and writers and the uh, contemporary writers and poets. But they are something else. Uh -huh. They are the oceans in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, Rumi, you know, our contemporary poets frequently travel back and forth to the United States and to Europe, and yet they, none of them have been able to find Rumi's popularity, Sadi's popularity, Omar Khayyam's popularity in the Western world, although they speak English and some other Western languages, mm -hmm. and they are aware 
and know how, what to write to cap, catch your attention. Mm -hmm. But they do not simply make it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Rumi, uh -huh. Sadi, Hafez. Okay. I'm amazed at seeing how many new translations are, are being published and made uh, in English of Rumi's works. There is always a new translator, a new translation, a new book published of Rumi. Coleman Barks, the American translator of Rumi, told me himself that from his translation, 2,500,000 copies in 14 different languages have been published and sold throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any final questions, please, oh, please, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> this is just a really quick question. I was just reading, oh, I'm Bailey Bradford, and I'm studying international relations. Um, I was just reading the Shana May, which I know is very important, and I'm sure you know a lot more about it than I do. And so I was just wondering if you have a favorite English translation, just because I felt as I was reading it that there were different things that mm -hmm. I would find were missing, mm -hmm. different important elements, and I know that you have to compromise when you're translating works, uh, but. What translation were you using? Um, I'm trying to remember. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, aware, but uh, my friend Betsy has my email address. <laughs> I promise I will do a <laughs> thorough research and will find <laughs> the best translation that I can okay. and will uh, send, uh, send it through an email to you. Right now, okay. I have never uh, looked for an English translation of Shahnameh, but I know that okay. it's one of the greatest works of the Persian literature. Thank okay. you for reading it. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, okay. thank you. Maybe this can be the start of a long friendship between us. Yes. Reading another book. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> That's a perfect pretext for okay. friendship. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> okay. you very much. Thanks for your questions, and please join me in thanking Ali. Thank you very much.